All right. So let's start. I would like to welcome all of you to the first Auto One Tech Meetup. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for finding the way into Maze. Um, I mean, it is called Maze, and uh, some of you have quite a way after them. So I hope you enjoyed the food. Uh, drinks, are not, drinks are on us, of course. Um, <clears throat> And um, I would like to introduce you a little bit into what we're going to do today. Uh, my name is Paul, I'm Director of Engineering at Auto One. And um, today we do something that is a continuation of uh, something that we started in 2018. Um, maybe for those who don't know what the company is actually about, we are a multi-channel used car trading platform. Um, we were founded in 2012. and. Um, in 2018, early 2018, we received a $2.9 billion evaluation, which makes us a unicorn or a multi-billion dollar company, um, however you want to call it. And in those, ten, in those seven years, um, we built this company based on technology mostly. And uh, we built it on a platform that we're actually quite proud of. And uh, we would like to use this opportunity and a couple of other opportunities to um, share this pride with you and kind of give something back to the community, uh, learnings that we had, things that we found out during this, insights, and um, <clears throat> yes, all kinds of other things. So um, one thing, kind of b basically the first learning, what you're seeing here is a snapshot of our platform, the very one that I just mentioned from today, like three o'clock. Yeah, so um, these are kind of all the uh, all the uh, microservices that we're running, uh, including the co including their connections, um, and that's kind of one of the like like a teaser into what we're going to talk about. Um, if you want to read more about the things that we do, we did create a uh, technology block in 2018 that was kind of the first initiative to say, hello, here we are, uh, we want to show what we can do and who we are and what, what we do in terms of tech, deep tech, culture, but also architecture, social things, uh, and so on and so on. So if you're interested in reading a little bit about it, just go to auto1.tech. <coughs> And um, additionally to this, um, also on that tech block, something that we started this summer was we launched um, we launched our tech radar, uh, which is something around 120 of the core technologies that we're using and all the, also the different stages in which we're using them. And we wanted to use this to kind of showcase the technology stack that we're using um, and sharing with everyone these are the things that we use, open source software from everyone, um, and to just kind of show that's what we, that's what we do. Um, this is what we're experimenting is and to kind of come do something with us. And um, <clears throat> some of the highlights I want to kind of point out, most of them are on the shirts. Um, so you can also find them um, on the on the bags that you got, which contain those very shirts. Uh, so you, this is something to take home for you. Um, we this year went into full con uh, full containerization setup, uh, which I like a lot because it gives massive amount of flexibility. Additionally to this, um, we recently migrated our full platform to Java 10, uh, looking at uh, Java 11 and uh, like hard higher versions uh, later. Um, we have all of our PHP services running on uh, Java uh, on PHP 7.3. Uh, these are our two main ecosystems, I would say. Um, on the front end, of course, we run uh, everything with uh, with JavaScript things, mostly React-based stuff that we use ES Next. And um, yeah, there's a couple of other things on there uh, which kind of uh, trigger people into, okay, buzzword, buzzword. So we're looking into micro front ends. Um, we do, or we started doing contract-first development, which I like a lot. And um, then one very tiny project that we have, uh, nonetheless important, is a small robot that we started to, building, to build. So there's a robotic operating system, uh, which for those who don't know, is not an operating system, but it's called like this. Um, and uh, yeah, so these are some of the more exciting pieces of technology that we have that I wanted to outline. And um, then we have this series of tech talks. So um, this is the first one. As I said already, we want to do six all, of, all over the next like 12 months, roughly. Um, so now that we have all of your email addresses, uh, we will continue to uh, spam invitations into your directions. <coughs> so uh, success. And um, you all know how CRM chains work nowadays. Uh, you can expect two to three emails per day, I guess. And um, at least, yeah. And on the weekend, a couple of more. Um, this this talk is going to set the kind of frame of what we want to do uh, by outlining um, things that we learned throughout our journey. So I said already, uh, company is now what we say seven years young. 
And um, in, in that case, or in, in those seven years, we learned quite a lot. And um, the kind of silver line between the things that, that we're going to talk about today will always be centered around growing and becoming more and more mature as a company. Um, there's more, of course, in the series of tech talks. Um, we want to do. We want to do basically everything. Yeah, we want to do, have uh, architecture panels. We want to do deep tech talks. We want to do master classes, lightning talks, um, discussion rounds. Um, you name it. Yeah. So we also have a series of internal hackathons. So thinkable that we open these hackathons in the scope of these tech talks for more public things. So we don't know yet. Um, we, what we know right now, and that's kind of one of the things that we can regularly do, we figure out what we do the first time and then reiterate over the next five times. Yeah, so that's where we are right now. And um, yes, without any further ado, I mean, you saw his picture all over the place. Um, <coughs> Nif will kind of hold the first talk today, which I'm very proud of um, because he has quite some history in Berlin. We have quite some history together. Um, we worked for seven years now together, and um, he's one of the key driving factors in pushing things forward wherever he is. And um, he's one of the fastest thinkers I know, and I know a lot of fast thinkers. So uh, please welcome with me Nif Liran. So, welcome everyone, and thank you, Paul, for this very warm introduction. I'm not used to this microphone, this was actually the original plan. So if you hear me like this, then uh, don't blame me. But yeah, so maybe we start with a quick question. So how many people in the crowd have ever owned and then obviously either bought or sold a new uh, used car? That's quite a lot. Um, so before we start, maybe I expand a bit about Auto One and who we are and what we do. So we were founded in Berlin in 2012 by Hakan and Christian and we are Europe's leading digital automotive trading platform. Uh, we have the mission to make car trading, uh, use, used car trading stress, uh, stressless, and basically we enable this by technology. We want to make it st uh, stressless both for sellers of used cars, which are normally people like you and me that want to sell their car but don't want the hassle, and for car dealers who want to get inventory but not to source it using... Uh, some methods that they use today. Our vision is to democratize the global used car business and transform it towards alternative mobility solutions. We might expand on that a bit later. Uh, some more stats, because we don't have enough stats. So we have 4,000 uh, employees across Europe, of which 4, 000, uh, 400 are in tech. We operate in 30 countries, and we so far traded 1.5 million units. If you want to imagine how 1.5 million units look like, we calculated it this morning, so it's 3,000 soccer fields or 15 uh, square kilometers, roughly, so which is quite a lot. We trade those cars with 60,000 professional dealers across Europe on the B2B channel, and we have, at any given point, 30,000 cars in stock. That's an easier number to imagine. That's around 100 football fields, or soccer, actually. We are in Europe. We sourced those cars from 400 branches across Europe, and last year our revenue was 2.9 billion euros. And how do we do all this? So we operate several brands. Uh, the C2B brand, the brand that we use to source cars from private sellers, thank you, is known in Germany as Verkauf und ein Auto DE, and in other countries it's known as Compramos to Coche or Neu Compriamo Auto in Italy and so on and so on. These are the consumer brands, which we use using a lot of online marketing uh, to get people into our 400 locations, evaluate their cars, make, the, make them price offers, and then eventually buy the cars. The cars that we buy from these people, we sell through two main channels. Uh, one is the B2B channel, it's auto1.com where dealers can see all the cars that we sourced and they can bid on them and buy them. We provide full transport solutions across Europe. So once the dealer bought, we take care to transport the cars to them. The other channel is the B2C channel. You might know it as Auto Hero, in which we sell cars for retail. So we refurbish them, we fully technically inspect them, and then we provide them to the um, and consumer who bought them. 
And of course, you came here for data. So we have a lot of data from the stuff that all most online companies have, like consumer data, marketing data, inventory, uh, fulfillment, of course, data about the dealers who buy the cars from us, but we have also two additional uh, and very important stacks of data. One is, oops, what did I do? Aha, uh -huh, we are back. So one of them is car data. So we evaluate cars using 150 different data points, including full technical specification. Is the radio, is the, I don't know, xenon lights, sunroof, etc. Status of the car, how many kilometers, how many previous owners, and then, of course, full visual documentation of the car, including uh, full damage documentation. The other set of data, which is very important, as we evaluated millions of cars so far and traded 1.5 million cars of those, we know actual real transaction data. So if you look in uh, Autoscout24 or Mobila.de, you would see prices of cars, of course, but these are asking prices, and it's very, very too impossible uh, to know the actual trade that happened behind the scenes. What we have is first we evaluated those cars, we made an offer to the customers, we know how much we offered and whether it was accepted or not. And of course, the cars that we did buy from customers, we sell onwards to dealers and we know how much uh, the dealers paid for them. And this is very useful for us to offer real-time pricing and other very important pricing statistics because pricing is one of the more transparent aspects of the car industry. So, what can you expect from this talk? Um, what we're going to do, we're going to share eight learnings that we made during uh, our seven years young company. They are sorted roughly in a chronological order, so what we learned when we were small and then what we learned when we were big. And we will demonstrate how we use data to define success of things, how we use data to make decisions, and how we use data to learn if stuff works or not. And the first learning, which we learned very, very early on, is laser focus. So when building a company, it's very, very important, it's actually critical to focus on the end game. So what is my user story? What is the main story of the company? Why am I building it? And basically understand what you want to do. In our case, we wanted to enable people to sell, to buy and sell cars in a seamless way. Um, once you figure that story, you need to keep your eyes on the target and don't get distracted by solving all kinds of edge cases. When you do see edge cases, try to assess the criticality and how many people are they going to affect. So if they affect, if you, first of all, if you cannot assess that, then of course you don't need to solve for it. If you could assess them, think, okay, is this going to affect most people or is this a handful of people or is this kind of remotely one in one million people will have it. To quantify focus is not the easiest task, but there are some points that, uh, that help you do that. First and foremost, you need to clearly define what's a blocker for your business or not. For us, in the beginning, the blocker was, for example, the customer cannot move the car. So in the beginning, we didn't want to handle those cases. Um, define ownership across your business, so who, who owns each part of the business model, who owns, in our case, the valuation of the car, who owns bringing in the leads, who owns the entire operational process, and so on. Um, it's related to focus, but uh, I mean, it's something that we actually like to stress quite a lot. When you do meetings, keep them short, keep them to the point, have an agenda, and have a conclusion that you want to reach in the end. So meetings without any end to them is one of the killers of efficiency and of focus. Uh, to give you an example of how we, we kept it focused, so the first Vilkauf and Reinauto uh, website was a list of static makes and models. So you would pick BMW, then three series, you would not get a price, and you, when you wanted to make uh, uh, an evaluation request, the email would go straight to the founders of the company. And then the rest of the process would be manual. So there was no back office, no capacity planning, and this actually enabled us to focus initially on bringing in the business, bringing in the leads, and iterating on that funnel as much as we can. 
One important thing I can share with you, so what you will see now is uh, the graph of one of our main funnels and how it evolved since the inception of the company. And uh, you can see some, of, co of course, some drops. We can talk about it a bit later, but overall, these are all iterations of, I don't know, tens of thousands of man hours of uh, working on this funnel. The other principle, you know it, some of you know it as Pareto principle, for us it's 80-20 is king. So um, basically it means that you, can inv you should invest 20% of the effort solving 80 or make, reaching an 80% good solution. And the example for us here, we built a logistics engine. So when dealers buy the cars, we need to transport it to them. As our dealers are across Europe and cars are not iPhones, you cannot put 10,000 cars on a truck and ship them everywhere. So cars are 10 per truck, roughly, sometimes eight. You need to plan this entire thing. Now, when you're small, you can do it manually and it's fine. As you grow, it becomes less and less scalable. So one of the things we've built, we've built a logistics engine that automatically creates the routes, communicates with all the partners on the way and makes things very smooth and efficient and most importantly, automated. But for the MVP of that uh, engine, we focused on the 80% cases. So we said, okay, dealers that are on an island and need ferry transport, out. We will ship to them, but the old way. Dealers who are in super remote locations, out. And we were left with roughly actually 90% of the dealers and we focused on them. This enabled the super fast delivery uh, for 90% of the dealers. And the remaining 10%, well, uh, they did not get more service than they used to get before. They got the same service, which was pretty good. And the result of that actually was a reduction of 60% in transport time a few weeks after the release of the feature. Next learning. So hiring is key. Uh, you should identify very early on uh, which hires do you need. Those hires are not always the managers and uh, freelancers are also a good option, especially early on, because especially in tech, they, um, they can onboard pretty quickly and they are used to switch companies so they can also start contributing quite quickly. Um, fun, fun statistic about that, so 25% of our uh, first 70 employees are, 20, are still with us to this day, so six years, five, six years after. And um, another learning that we learned, now it's beeps, no. um, is that young talent who doesn't have five to six or five to ten years of experience is not really a risk, so we actually appreciate and develop young talents because they have very, very fresh ideas, so they have different perspectives and they would say stuff that you, oh my God, I didn't think of that. And they integrate quite easily into your company's DNA. Uh, two of our principal product managers and two of our engineering directors actually started with us uh, five to six years ago as juniors or mid-levels. And also two of our current VPs actually started as, one of them even started as an intern. So young talent is well worth investing in. But, uh, when, so of course hiring uh, uh, great people and retaining them is the ultimate reward for any company. But sometimes there is a mismatch between the company's expectations and the employee's expectation. And in those cases, making your, your decision uh, about the probation, whether the employee is, is, is going to go for probation or not, is actually making it as early as possible is helpful for both sides. Why? So on one hand, uh, it lets the, em the employees spend time in a company where they would fulfill their uh, full potential. And it fills a position in the company to hire talent that will uh, be fully into the challenge and actually deliver to expectations. So there's a guy called Lawrence, which in 2012, and that's a piece of data, um, found that a, mi a misfit between the company and the employee leads to a 39% reduction in employee uh, productivity. And not only that, it also leads to a 33% decrease in retention for the employee's direct peers. So making those decisions early on can save a lot of uh, frustration for both sides. 
third one, so we are close to half. Um, basically, save and measure everything. When you're a young company, you move fast, you make mistakes fast, you, you break things, as some people say, but you also collect data. And this data, in the beginning, might not be that uh, plenty of data because you still don't have a lot of customers, but you make a lot of frequent attempts, and one thing we've learned is that we should save all the data from that. Now, without going into trivials like you know uh, code changes or database changes, this for this most of us have uh, GitHub. Um, what we're talking about is more around um, business data, tech data, so all kinds of experiments that you've done, and don't underestimate the importance of good database structure because these mistakes that you make early on with the wrong database structure are among the hardest to fix when you move forward. Uh, for example, I will let you read it because I'm blocking it. In Auto One, we maintain something called the change log. The change log is basically storing every single value change in the database. Now, why is it important? It's important for several reasons. One, if you made some mistake or there is some bug and you want to retrace the chain of events that happened, this is super helpful. If you want to recover from that mistake, you know the original values at any given point of time and you can actually roll back whatever happened in the system. And last, uh, as it's a full audit log, it's also important uh, to maintain security and it also it's really helpful with any kinds of audits that you go through. Business history, um, we maintain a document called Captain's Log. By the way, Auto One's change log has 4 billion, 101 million and 578, 173 rows, as of Friday. Um, so there is something called Captain's Log. Captain's Log is basically saving uh, if major business-related releases that we've made. So if we're testing a new funnel, or if we're changing something in our pricing mix, or anything that has any business significance goes into this log. And so we know when significant business-related releases happen. So you're looking back six months, we look at trends of conversion, trends of inventory or whatever, we can actually try to relate them to certain releases. And uh, also very important, so you, going back to the drops you saw in the previous graph, I can tell you that a lot of them are related to uh, stuff like our marketing mix. So for example, if we tune down marketing a bit, then of course conversion increases because the more interested people are still coming to the website. Uh, seasonality is a big factor, the way you price things, and of course, major external events. So if we spoke about 80-20 uh, is king, so flexibility is queen. So the earlier you are, the less uh, critical it is to plan five phases ahead, have like super detailed specifications of we're going to do that and that and that and that, because it's going to change. No matter how strongly you believe that you're doing the right thing, trust me, everything is going to change after maybe the second step because you will gather a lot of learnings. Uh, one example we can make here, so one of our initial assumptions as a car dealer, so you know these like little cards that if you own a car, they appear on your window every morning or if you see them on cars. So if you, if, you ever, if you ever call one of these numbers, the dealer will actually come to you and evaluate your car and will tell you, Oh, you know, your car is not so good, I can only offer you that. And one of our assumptions was that we need to come to customers as well. Of course, we don't tell people anything bad about their cars, but we still assumed in the beginning that we had to show up and evaluate the car at the purchaser spot. Now, those of you who know the company a bit uh, better than, than uh, or for some time, know that we don't do it anymore. We have branches. And a question to you is, why did we let that model go? And? Yes, too expensive. So when you go, when you drive to a, a customer, there's the guy called the purchaser. He drives the car, he's supposed to meet the customer. So driving time is lost time. There is no money being made person is on the road, might or might not make it on time. 
And then when they make it to the customers, uh, uh, to the meeting point, the customer may or may not be there because, you know, life happens. Kid is sick, it's raining, there's traffic, or for some reason the customer does not show up. And if the customer did show up, then I know, you know, like not everyone sells their cars to us, and there are also cases that people, we drove all the way, we waited for the customer, we met him, and we did not get the car. And we were planning already how do we do the logistics and the planning and optimizing the routes in the city, how to get the customers faster, but we very, very quickly realized that we're not going to do that, and instead we went for branches. Why? Because in, in a branch you can, A, you can control the experience, B, the purchasers are not driving anywhere, so there are slots and people show up, and you can control no-shows the same way that airlines control it by doing some overbooking. Know when to stop. So also when you test and you try different models, you also need when to, you, you also need when need to know when to stop. Uh, there's something called the sunk for, uh, sunk cost fallacy, where it describes the human tendency to throw good money after bad money. Or in other words, it's the more we invest in something, and this can include plans, features, um, gambling. Not that anyone does it, but. Um, Basically, it's how to let go of something you already invested in. And this is also true for our plans as a company. So we should know that whatever we planned was, a scrap, it was basically a sunk cost. And if it doesn't work, we should scrap it. And in, in software and in product in general, this means be reasonable in your testing. So time box your test, set some minimum success criteria for the test, and contradictory to everything I just said, also, if you're just about to succeed, and this is you, the time box is over, but you see you're very close to your success criteria, make one more attempt. So you might actually make it work somehow. And one example I can give on this one. So who knows what is FOMO? I guess most people, you're not even raising hands, so you know. Um, so we invested a lot in A-B testing a feature, a B2B feature on auto1.com to try to uh, create some FOMO among the users. So you know FOMO from booking.com, you try to book a hotel, they tell you, oh, five people just booked it, or 30 people are just looking, etc. We try to do the same with cars. And we A-B tested this quite heavily, and we said, okay, results are inconclusive, but as we already invested in it, let's launch it. And I'm very sad to say that uh, actually the FOMO elements are one of the most clicked elements on the website because people don't like them. And we are now A-B testing them out of the website. So we are trying to see what happens if we remove them because maybe people got used to them. Uh, you cannot grow, you cannot scale to uh, 200, 300, 400 people just in tech, not talking even about the rest of the company if you don't communicate. So keep explaining why you're doing what you're doing, when stuff should come, why, uh, how are the things that you ask your teams to do fit in the grand plan, and make sure everyone is aligned all the time. Because people don't assume that everybody communicated with everybody. People are usually focused on delivering on their stuff, and they're highly good at that. But if it's not in their task definition to communicate this across the, the company, they probably won't. So it's your job as a manager, as a stakeholder, as even as an engineer or as a product manager to actually keep stuff going. And generally what we do at Auto One, we have what we call a culture of presence. So we try, okay, I will figure it out, yes. Uh, we try to, first of all, talk to the people in person, go to their desks, ask the question. Then if we, they are not there, we try to call. And only if we don't call, then we opt for good old Slack and email. And after you communicated, you also need to be very transparent around about the results of any task, feature, or anything that you did. So communicate results, celebrate success, share uh, the results, but also be sure to learn from mistakes. So we have the habit uh, in Auto One Tech to do post-mortems for stuff that did not work so well. On the other hand, we also have an all hands every few weeks where we give champagnes to uh, 
teams that made uh, exceptional or noteworthy achievements in those weeks. Almost there, so make or buy. When you're a tech company and you need a software solution, your tendency is always to have this dilemma or, okay, should I now develop quickly something that will uh, um, serve some need that I have right now, like vacations, like a list of employees, whatever, or should I just buy something like big HR system? And this is, I mean, a topic for a completely different presentation and for a whole presentation, but uh, to give you the auto one angle on it, so in our view, in-house takes longer, it's not more affordable because people's time also costs money, um, but it's tailor-made, so it might not have like a huge set of features, but it will do exactly what you wanted it to do. If you buy, uh, you can get it immediately, so you know, you can sign up to whatever SaaS that you want to use to solve your problem, and uh, you get it immediately, but it's not always better, because in those cases, you have to adapt your processes and your way of working to the tool that you just bought, instead of building a tool that adapts to your way of working. Um, one thing that we are super, super proud of, and we've built it, we ended up building it, and we are very, very happy about this decision because it's now serving our entire company, is our internet. So in the beginning, well, it's not exactly buy, we tried to use WordPress, we took WordPress, we adapted it, we tried to use it for our purposes, but it had two major problems. One, internationalization was a challenge. We have 25 countries, 25 languages, and uh, internationalizing is quite hard. And two, it's very hard to integrate it into the permission system, into the uh, SSO mechanism, and then have quarantine sections for each department. So we researched a bit, we, made, so we uh, did some RFPs, we got some offers for ready internet tools, but we ended up taking a team for two months and building it entirely from scratch, and Two months later, I think we are launching it uh, just these days. It's actually really, really working nicely. Uh, yes, very unberliner kind of words, but when you grow, you also need to cooperate up. So you need to introduce some processes, you need to introduce some frameworks, because when you have so many employees and so many things going on, you need some uh, kind of structure. But you don't need to throw, just take you know, a template of how to run a corporate and throw it on your company, create endless amounts of red tape, but what we try to do is to adapt our, um, our processes to the company. So we highly criticize every new process that is introduced in the company. We say, okay, is this step really necessary? How can I make it shorter? And try to keep it very, very, very entrepreneurial. We also try to adapt structures to the company size. So if you look at uh, Auto One Tech, we had three reorganizations since 2014. In the first one, we switched from um, application-based structures, so for, from having a front-end team, a back-office team, and a back-end team, we switched to business line-based structures. So inbound finals team, purchasing team, pricing team, logistics team, et cetera. Uh, et cetera. And in the second iteration that we did now, it's um, just recently, we switched to a business-based structure. So not just business line, but actually business-based. So we have the auto hero team, which is retail. Uh, we have the classic C2B teams that are dealing with sourcing the cars. And we have the B2B services group. So that was it. I, uh, basically, these are the eight learnings that we had. Uh, so laser focus, hiring is key, measure and save everything, flexibility is queen, I tell you that, know when to stop, keep communicating, <laughs> make or buy, and cooperate up your way. Thank you. <laughs>